We've got Chris Brown going to be starting here this morning talking about headers. Then we've got uh, Mike Derrymeans will be going over our combine optimization uh, on, in the machines. And then I'm going to finish up here this morning going over combine technology. Um, please type in questions into the chat at any time uh, as, as we're going through here this morning. We will try and pause roughly halfway through for about a five minute break. Um, thank you to those that submitted questions when you registered. Um, we will try and cover those as we go through the course content. Uh, if we don't try and uh, explain it maybe adequately, please uh, let us know. Um, your mics are muted and they will stay muted until the end, uh, end of the day. If you have questions, we can unmute you um, and you can feel free to ask questions and we'll try to answer them. Um, but with that, um, we will try and uh, keep, keep the ball rolling here. So we'll have Chris kind of get into and start talking about the headers. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off here with our uh, front end equipment. So just to start off with the pickup heads. So model year 2020 and prior, we ran the 615Ps. And then for model year 21 to the current production, we're running the BP15s. So you're going to notice the BP15. What does the BP15 stand for? So the BP stands for belt pickup. And the number after the BP is indicating that the belt, it's a belt pickup and it's 15 feet wide. So the change from the 615Ps to the BP15s, the biggest change is we've added the header control unit. So it's an HCU uh, before the HCUs were mounted on the comm lines. So every time you always have to unhook and hook back up to your 615P, you'd have to do a header calibration because they didn't recognize the, the pickup head that you're the unit you had on the front. So now with the BP15s with the HCU, so the HCU now on the pickup head, it actually tracks the, the hour usage, service intervals. Uh, once you do a calibration of that header, that header calibration is stored on the HCU and you should only have to calibrate that header once when you first initially hook up to it at the start of the year. So you can unhook it and hook it back up through the course of the year and those calibration values will be stored on the HCU. It also it'll store the, the, the width of the header and your record on or stop pipes on the HCU also. Back to the 615Ps, uh, the early ones, uh, guys are having troubles with the windscreen. When you raise and lower your windscreen, it's very fast. It almost seems like it's going to throw the windscreen into the ground or over top of the top of the combine. Or you'll notice the, the left hand or right hand side windscreen will start creeping down on you as you're going across the field. Uh, the fix for that is you can order it through the parts department. It's a, a check valve orifice kit, and you can see the little red circle there indicating that's what the kit uh, looks like. If you don't have that on your header, you probably may want to consider ordering through parts and getting it installed. Here's just showing the, the, the latch pin holes on the, the pickup heads. Uh, if you're noticing that you're your single point lever is very hard to engage the pins and lock into position. Probably the, the latch plate on the pickup head needs to be adjusted. So to adjust it, you just undo the, the two, loosen the two, uh, two bolts here, and then this plate will actually move in and out and up and down uh, to realign the, the, the hole so the pins, latch pins go in there. Don't get too aggressive with that single point coupler lever because there is a little small eight mil bolt in that cable and if you get too rammy it'll actually shear that 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 shear uh, bolt out of there there is three replacement bolts right on this uh, single point uh, lever housing so here's just picture showing the retractable fingers as this will go for the belt pickups and auger heads uh, on the auger heads and the belt pickups. Uh, if you break them, there's showing right here, this little circle here is showing a little groove cut into the retractable fingers. Those retractable fingers groove is in there for a shear shear point. So if you hit a stone or stone goes into the auger or some form material, it'll break off and it'll actually fall into the auger tube. Uh, so if you're noticing the, there's a little bit of a noise clanging coming from the auger, 
nine times out of ten, you probably have a broken retractable finger floating around in the auger tube. Uh, just recommendation, pull that broken piece out because we've seen it in the past where that piece will float around and then it'll get jammed or hooked in the, the cam assembly in the auger tube and have a tendency it, it will punch a hole through the auger tube and now you're welding and patching a hole in your auger tube. Here, uh, guys have run it into like some buckwheat or viney material or four material. It'll get uh, wrapped up on the end sheet and underneath the canvas and on the front roll or the back roller. Uh, just recommendation, you can pull the outside row of teeth off here, or some guys actually have gone to the point where they've pulled the outside two rolls off to eliminate that material from getting wrapped in under the end sheet and, and the rollers. One of the, the bigger questions we get to start a harvest or partway through harvest, guys will phone in saying, I got a code popping up my, on my, on my armrest is saying my header height sensor voltage is out of range. Or my belts are tracking to one side, left side or right side. Uh, the first thing to check, I, we always tell guys, especially on the header height sensor voltage out of range, is your airbag pressure is nine times out of 10 is, is either too low uh, on it, the on the right hand side, of the pickup head. You're going to see this, this is just a picture of the decal going through the procedure of the the adjustment of the air brake operating range. Here's saying that the top arrow here is is you have too much air pressure, and the bottom saying you have to have to add air. And here's your adjustment point. So this linkage here. I always like to bring it so that the bottom edge right here is just above this little line here. So here's just a picture showing the, 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 the range of this uh, too high, too low range. And here's your ideal operating range here. When you're adjusting your airbag pressure, make sure that the pickup is high enough off the ground so that the air, so the wheels are suspended, not touching the ground. And just to adjust your airbag pressure and left hand, right hand side airbag. Here is just showing the, the little Schrader valve, a little fill port to pop that cap off, put the tire chuck on there and keep on bumping air pressure into the airbag until the linkage is just above this, this line right here. Uh, 615 and the BP pickup heads. Uh, if you're finding the materials coming over top of the auger and throwing it onto the, the, the pickup belts, uh, probably one of the key, the adjustments, major adjustment that needs to be done is the, the, the gap between this flighting here and then this rear stripper right here. Uh, there's a row of bolts or nuts all the way across on the left hand, right hand side, loosen them off, pull that stripper back or forward. Uh, the factory spec for that clearance, the stripper clearance is a quarter of an inch. So just take a little quarter inch key stock, quarter inch drill bit, put the gap between the flighting and the stripper at quarter inch, tighten them down. Uh, before you engage the pickup heads, uh, I would recommend just spinning that auger over by hand just to make sure that the, the, the gap is set correctly and you're not going to do damage to the flighting or the stripper. Now we're going to get into the straight cut headers. Straight cut headers, so model year 20 and prior, we had three different types of heads. We had the 600 and 700 flex heads. We had the 600 and 700 draper heads. And then we also had the 600 and 700 FDs, our flex drapers. On the bottom here, you can see on the flex heads, we ranged from 20 feet to 35 feet. On the draper heads, we were 25 to 40 feet. And on the flex drapers, we range from 30 to 45 feet. Uh, some platform setups, uh, some key, key adjustments that guys overlook through the course of the year. Uh, the knife drive alignment, knife head alignment, hold down adjustments, stripper location, location and the front feed plate adjustment. Here we're just going to do a on the S600 series, the earlier models were non-hydraulically adjusted, and later on we went on the the 600, later 600s, and all the S700s were all hydraulically adjusted. So, on the earlier ones, they're, they're manually adjusted. So, how to adjust them properly is you lower your feeder hose down, and from this 
bolt, center this bolt to the ground, you should have uh, 35 and a half inches of, of adjustment. Yeah, from the ground up to the center of the bolt should be 35 and a half inches. To adjust it, you have to loosen this nut and then loosen these two bolts on both left hand and right hand side. And on top of the feeder house, you're gonna see a long uh, strap or linkage on the left hand and right hand side. You basically unscrew it to push it forward or backwards. Uh, the proper adjustment is, so when it's at 35 and a half inches, the front face plate, feed plate should be, should be vertical. Once you have that adjustment done, you, you, you tighten the nuts, the bolts here to 222 foot pounds and the lower one to 460. Uh, some guys, if they're straight cutting and they want to get their, they don't get their guards quite low enough to the ground, guys will actually take this front feed plate and will actually tilt it past vertical more forward. And that's going to basically bring the back of the header back, but it's going to bring the, the guards closer to the ground. Uh, some guys say, well, it's too close to the ground. I want my guards a little higher. They'll actually take the, the uh, feed plate and they'll tilt it back towards the combine and that'll bring the nose of the guard up. But you have to remember, it's going to push the back of the header closer to the ground. Uh, what you could see is it'd be too close to the ground and the back of the, the header will actually start plowing or cutting the, the dirt and you have to start lifting your header up off the ground to eliminate that or bring this front feed plate back to the, the vertical position. On the same adjustment goes for the 600 and 700 flex heads is a quarter inch gap on the stripper. Uh, one thing here, you, uh, big big phone call in the start of the year with the, the flex heads, the auger heads is they sit outside, guys will phone in and saying that they're, my auger stripper clearance is set to quarter inch, but I'm still getting the pile material flying forward onto my reel and it's, it's not, not stripping it. Uh, probably what's happened is the there's a little bit of rust and on the floor and on the auger here and things aren't really polished up and about an hour or two later after the guy starts using it the problem that they had with the material flying forward is is gone because everything's polished up and it's, it's flown nice and and clean to the 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 feeder hose uh just a little food for thought here guys are using your header and it's still hooked up to the combine and in really hot days and they go back in the mid afternoon and it's 35 degrees and the augers locked to the feeder host of the shaft there they go to start the the header at 35 40 feet there are 35 foot augers the that auger actually will flex in the heat and with it locked to the feeder host it has nowhere to roll because if you actually leave that unhooked during the heat, the day you put a mark on it and you come back a couple hours later, that mark actually will move because that header is actually freewheeling and, and rolling. So it's, it, it's, it's flexing in the heat. Hold down adjustments is one of the most neglected adjustment on all straight cut headers. Uh, for example, how critical is just take a pair of scissors take the the center screw out of the uh, your scissors and you uh, back it off one turn and try to cut a piece of paper i probably can guarantee you the paper will not be cut because it's it's set too far apart and the scissors aren't going to be cutting same thing with the knife adjustment here the hold downs you want that hold down kind of pushing down on the knife so you get that the, the knife section is cutting sharply against the edge of the, the guard so that their adjustment is normally uh, in all heads is a 20 thousandths inch of a gap the minimum gap i'd like to see is, is 12 thou or a business card a normal business card is about 14 to 16 thousandths of a gap knife drive alignment and knife head alignment so the knife head alignment is done by loosening these two bolts off here and you're going to see here that the, the wobble box side and the knife head side the, the it's, it's a tapered angle on the mating side of those two tapers there's actually little grooves cut in there to basically lock that head in as to where you want it higher or lower the ideal adjustment for the the knife head alignment is right here you can see there you want a gap between the the, the uh, 
knife section and the guard. If you have it too low down, it's actually going to create some heat and it's going to wear the knife and the guard down. And same thing, if you have it too high up, it's going to wear the, the top edge. So you want it just kind of right in the middle of, of the, the guard, the, the gap of the guard and the knife. Picture right here is just showing there is actually a little plastic white neoprene uh, bushing in, in the knife head. Here's just showing an indicator that the, the, the white Neoprene bushing is basically it, it's gone or it's wore out and the knife head has actually slid slid down and it, it's starting to wear into the the in, end skin shoe. To replace it, you basically you do the, the two bolts, slide the knife out and. And pull it out of there and then there's a, you can get a replacement white the, 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 bare, the plastic bushing from from the parts department. Here, just showing the changes of the 600 FD, the, the rear cross auger to the 700. So in the 600 series, we ran a 14 inch auger. And then the 700s, we went to an 18 inch auger. That 18 inch auger is the same size of auger that we run in our, our corn heads. And on the right hand side of the head, you're gonna notice there's gonna be a little uh, flow valve there. Uh, with a jam nut and do the jam nut and turn it in turn it out and to increase or decrease the auger speed the auger supply oil to drive that oil is actually taken from the draper return line fed into the the pressure side of the auger and then the return side of the auger gets put back into the return oil circuit and back to the combine uh, that ideal speed for that auger, I would say guys like to run it. I like to run it uh, just a little tad faster than the the draper speed of, of the head is kind of the ideal speed for that auger. Here's just a little uh, few pictures here to show indicate that the headers flex heads would come with this extra long nose cone guys doing straight cutting wheat or canola they're going to turn up the headlands or doing headlands and then this big nose piece here is just trampling and thrashing out the grain so guys have taken this nose piece off and they've ordered through the parts department these end crop divider rods slide it in the existing square tube and they they, they eliminate that that tramping of the crop when they're turning here you're going to notice the arrow point in the difference between this shield end reel and this end reel. One's fully enclosed, this one isn't. If you had a flip over option on your head, these little pieces here would be gone and there'd be just little arms sticking up. Uh, with the little arms sticking up, guys doing flax, soya beans, uh, they'll have a tendency to wrap on the, you know, on the end arms here. So now Deere's offered a, uh, an enclosure kit you can buy through parts to put it on and to eliminate the, the crop wrapping on the left hand, right hand side of the reels. Here's just indicating the, this adjustment is your, your canvas tension. So your canvas tension, you're gonna have one on the left hand side, we're gonna have one on the right hand side. Uh, this here is indicating is the canvas tension is too loose. So you take a 15 mil wrench or a 24 mil socket and you put it on this, this nut here counterclockwise is going to tension it up counterclockwise is going to loosen the tension uh, the ideal operating range is right here right in the middle of the green is your ideal operating tension for for the belts when you adjust the belts it actually adjusts the the both belts at the same time on uh, 600 fds if guys are having problems or you're seeing that your reel, your fore and aft, so that's your reel forward and reel backwards is really aggressive uh, moving in and out. Or if you're, you're going across the field and you notice that the reel is starting to creep out, uh, there is a orifice valve, check valve kit purchased through parts that you can install on the header, just like this uh, pickup heads. And this is, gets mounted just on the left hand side and the outside of the gearbox. Model year 17 and newer deer had come out with a guys are complaining there's getting a lot of dribble or grain leakage between the, the, the canvas and the center section. So they come out with a center section seal kit, which you can see it's right here. They installed it and then over the course of the years, they've started off like and they changed the kits 
from 20, some 17 to the current production and the current production now they've said that they've reduced 45% of the grain loss coming between the, the belt and the center section with this seal kit. Here's showing the 700 FDs. We went to a, a, a double V groove belt on the 600 series. We only had one with the 600 series. Guys are complaining that the belt was actually popping out or was actually drifting down and, and rubbing here on the front of the header. With the double groove belt now, belt now it has eliminated the, the, the belt slide down to the bottom. Now in the 700 series, uh, heads, we have a symmetrical belt design. So what the symmetrical belt design gives us, it gives us options to move those belts around on the header. So we can take the the left belt, the right left and right belt, swap them from end to end. Same thing with the center section, swap them from side to side. And then also we can take those belts and flip them so they drive on the from top to bottom. So it gives us four times the life on the belts now, a little bit of universal. Uh, there, so if you get, get a little bit of a tear in the bottom, you really don't want to place it, replace it. You can actually take the belt and just give it a flip, half a flip or side to side, and it'll start driving on the other side. Model of the year 18 to current machines. We went, the Deers changed the, the center drum. Uh, the center drum is nine inches wider. It has a, uh, a longer taper on it. Also, we have an auger flating you can see here and on the back side of the head on of the auger tube, you're going to see that there's actually there's a stripper in the back side and they've added some retractable fingers on it. Why they did this is because on the previous heads at the center drum, we were getting material that was loading up on the end sheets here before it was coming into the feeder hose and it would load up on the sides here and then when it would offload it would come into the center section and then bang the feeder host was plugged now with this design here now and wider is actually pulling the material in from the sides and is evenly feeding the the, the crop into the feeder host and eliminating the offloading and wadding on, into the feeder chain also 18 and current production machines, we have added a fourth uh, sensor to the header height sensing. And with the add in the, the fourth sensor, it's improved the uh, header height sensing on the header. And it's only available on the 35, 40 foot and the 45 foot heads. So now we're gonna get into the model year 21 and current models now we're going to notice same thing as the, the the bp heads we have uh, uh two numbers and it's going to be the size in the middle and then we're going to have num uh, another letter uh, on the end so what does it mean so so we have an hd 50r so it's a hinge draper it's 50 feet and the cutter bar is 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 rigid so in those op in those header models there we have 35 40 45 foot and 50 foot heads there we go to we have a, an RD 45F, so it's a hinged head, it's 45 feet, and the cutter bar is flexing. And those heads are from 30, 35, 40, and 45 foot heads. So what, what heads got replaced? So on the hinged flex head, it has replaced the old 700 and 600 series FDs. And you may notice here we only have yeah it's, they've added the 600s we only went to 40 feet and when we went to the 700 series we went to 45 and carried the 45 foot over into the rdfs and our new head for this year is our hinged hinged flex head and in the hinged flex head we go from 35 feet up to 50 feet just showing the the picture of the back side of the head so right from the 35 feet right to the 50 foot heads you're going to notice this measurement here does not change at all from the 35 to 50 foot only thing that changes as we get bigger the second gauge wheel gets moved further to the outside of the head Here showing the on the hinged heads we have on the left hand side right hand side we have a con control valve with a with a red handle and a little red button guys are going to say well what does what does that do kind of confuse how that works 
The red handle, if it's in the up position, it's on the unlocked and the head will actually relax and go into a frown. That lever here is only a safety lever. So if you were going to say lift it up and you wanted to do work underneath the head, you'd lock the feeder house out so the feeder house lock is in, in place. And then you would put this lever in the horizontal position so that'll lock the header up so it doesn't sag down and could injure someone. A little red button on here, you have you have two options. You can push it in, turn it clockwise to lock it, push it in, turn it counterclockwise to unlock it. Uh, it's kind of confusing. Uh, how it was explained to me, Matt explained it to us here, is the, the lower picture is for infield. The upper picture is for transport. Uh, so if you're going to put the header onto the trailer, You'll want the button so it's pushed in in the lock position. Put the header onto the trailer. And once it's on the trailer, you want to push it and turn it clockwise so the button's out. And this is going to do is it's going to relax that header onto the trailer. If you don't do that, what will happen as the headers bounce and you're going down the road and it hits a few bumps, the header wings, the left hand, right hand hinge wings are going to start bouncing and they're going to start building a pressure and they're going to start coming into into a I would call it a, a smile, and that's going to put extra pressure on the hydraulic system that you don't want. So when you put it on the trailer, push it in, turn it counterclockwise, and it's going to relax that header onto the trailer, and it's going to be all good. When you go to take that header off the trailer, you want to push the button in, turn it clockwise so it's pushed in, and that's going to lock the header up. Because <clears throat> if you don't do that, when you go to lift the header up, with that button pushed, released out, it's actually the header is going to go into a frown, and you may not get your the header off the trailer. It may get hung up on some of the supports, brackets, and that. So push it in, lock it, pull it off, and you are off to the races. Hook your combine up, and you're good to go. On the hinged heads, we've the deers come out with a. Uh, Couple of cool little options on the right hand and left hand. The uh, crop dividers is actually lights. They've mount LED lights. They mounted in the nose cones, and they've also added a another light on the side sheet that kind of illuminates the John Deere logo. But also, what it does is the, it, this idea actually came from the grain cart operators. They wanted some lights on the end of the header, so when they're coming up to the con header unloading, they can actually see where that header is versus getting too close and running into it and doing some damage. Uh, also on the hinged heads, they've added the same thing as the H HCU is the header control unit and it does the exact same thing as we talked about and the belt pickups, the BPs, it records the hours, it uh, service hours, the header calibration, the width and the record stop heights also. Air just going to go through a slide here just to do a, a knife recommendation. So in the top, we're going to see here is our knife. We're going to have fine tooth. We're going to have a coarse tooth that SL is the, the, the six sickle or section knife is, is, is a long short. And then we're just going to have a straight uh, coarse tooth. The bottoms are going to have short guards, long guard, short guard, long or shorts. Uh, canola and wheat, barley and rye. Deer's recommending that the best option is uh, is long, uh, better is is short. Uh, soybeans, they're saying that a coarse tooth short guard is best, and no till, they're saying the coarse tooth long. So a lot of guys, a lot of our headers are actually ordered in with a, with a short guard, coarse tooth. But some guys are actually adding now. They're when they order in their headers, they're ordering a the spare knife is 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 a fine tooth so in cereals and that they're going to slide the, the coarse tooth out and then they'll slide their fine tooth in to do the cereals when once they get into their their soybeans they slide this fine tooth out and then they slide the coarse tooth in you're just in, uh, showing a picture of the the, the flex the, the range of the of the hinged head so on a 45 foot hinged rigid head the, the, the range we have is 20, 20 inches plus or minus an inch. And on the 50 foot heads, we have 23 inches plus or minus an inch. 
Uh, Macdon FD 145s, they only have a 10 inch movement plus or minus an inch. Model year 21 factory options. Uh, we have an option now that's called the grain saver belt. So the canvases now have uh, these little cleats embedded into the canvas. That's basically eliminate, if you're straight cutting canola, black or any kind of grain, it's going to eliminate the grain from sliding down to the, to the front edge of, of the cutter bar out here in the front. It's going to carry it in and put it into the center belt, convey it up to the feeder house. Uh, same thing we talked about here earlier, center section seal kit, but this picture here I wanted to bring attention to right here at the top. You're going to notice that there's a little cleat, molded cleat with some grooves in it, top and bottom. That there is built and designed to clean the bottom edge of the cutter knife as the belt's going round and round. It's going to clean it and eliminate that material from jamming up uh, at the bottom of the cutter bar. Uh, another option we have here is the top cross auger now can be ordered with the retractable finger option in it. And last but not least, the hinged heads now we can order the heads with side side knives uh, from factory. Or if you want to spend some extra money, you can actually convert the hinged heads. If your header is not side knife ready, you can actually order stuff through the parts department, change the wobble box out left and right hand side, order the knife option and install it. These knife options here, it's probably going to take you longer to carry it from the truck or the back side of the header and around uh, to hook it up than it does to get it installed. All it does is it hooks on a little latch in the bottom here. You, you bring it forward and there's a little, a little lever with a little hook that hooks onto the front nose piece here. Turn it down, locks it in place, and it's actually driven off the front side of the knife drive on the left hand and right hand side. Model year 21 heads on the left hand side of the header adapter. There's actually a two speed uh, gearbox. Here, just showing on, in low speed, the, the front, front drum is going to be turning at 200 RPM. The center bell is going to be turning at 340. You shift it to high, the drum is going to turn at 340, and the center bell is going to turn at 388. So you can say, well, what speed should I be running it in? So chickpeas, lentils, soya beans, you're going to run it in, in, in low range. So the lever is going to be pulled, this lever here is going to be pulled to the outside. And then for canola and high yielding wheat, you're going to push the lever in, in for, for high speed. Uh, the 18 inch augers that we're using now on uh, the hinge heads, they're, they're full auger flighting and they also have a little metal stripper on the back side to strip the material as it conveys it across over to the center section. A little different control setup for the hinged heads versus the 600, 700 series augers. Uh, we have a, here we have a, a, a valve block. You're gonna either be down, down for on, up for off. And then here you're gonna see it's just control valve. You screwed in clockwise to slow it down and counterclockwise to speed it up. And same thing goes for the speed here. You want it turning just a little bit faster than your, your canvases are turning. Here you can go through the HD heads, the hinged head and rigid head. The uh, canvas tension is similar to the 600, 700 series FDs, uh, left hand, right hand side, same adjustment and same thing. You want the little indicator here right in the middle of the green is the ideal right tension for the drives. Uh, same thing, 24 mil or 15, 16 uh, socket ratchet goes onto this nut here. And it also the same thing. When you tighten left to right side, it tightens both belts at the same time. Uh, just a little bit of refresher here. We are, same thing goes for the hold down adjustments on the hinged heads. It's a normal gap, 20 thou, minimum hold down is 12 and business card uh, works also. Or if you want to take the wife's credit card away from her and you can use it there to, to set the adjustment to the gap also. And same thing goes with the knife heads on the hinged heads. Same thing is here's the correct adjustment and do the two bolts here to raise and lower your, your, your knife head alignment. 
and same same bushing, same knife head as the hinge heads as it is on the hinged and hinged or the 600 and 700 series FDs. And we're just going to do a little brief, little brief touch on the corn heads. We're not going to get into very much detail here. Uh, so the corn heads, the modeling has changed also on the corn heads, just like they did on the BPs and the hinged heads. So now we have a C18F. So C is basically stands for corn head. 18 is basically the number of rows that head is. And the F, you can either have a folding or you can have a hinged head. So in the, in, the, in the rigid heads, we go from a 16, six row all the way up to an 18 row. And then the folding corn heads uh, would be just the folding base. It's, it's like your, your air seeder or your cultivator. The outside wings actually fold up vertically. And those heads there range from 12 row up to the 16 row. And the corn head, the corn head chopping heads, which is most of the heads we're all selling now are all uh, chopping heads. You can see here there's a blade and on the opposite side, adjacent side, there's going to be another blade to engage or disengage those heads. There's chopping the, the chopping gearbox. There's little, you have to lift up that, that front piece, nose piece. And then under that, you're going to see here is going to be a little aluminum lever. You push it up or down and that lever there, you can either turn that head into a chopping head or into a non non chopping head. Uh, in front of the head, you have an option you can add. You can add the, they call it a head to uh, row sensing. So you got a little feeler here and a little feeler here. There's calibration in the armrest there in the combine. You basically calibrate those sensors. Uh, you're still using your auto steer, but instead of using your AB or your your, your heading line, it's actually the, the row sense Feelers here are basically feeling the the, the row of the how you planted the, the, the corn, and it's going to basically steer uh, steer just like the auto steer, but it's using the the rows of the corn to do the steering instead of the the AB line. And with that, I am done. Good morning. I'm going to be covering uh, the uh, combine optimization portion of the session this morning. Uh, we are going to kind of start getting getting ready to start here. Um, uh, my name is Mike Dermans. I've been with Hens Brothers for quite some time now. Um, so we'll get the, the ball rolling. Uh, we're doing the combine optimization for 600 and S700 series combines. So we won't be going into a lot of details on attachments and that because they can vary quite uh, dramatically from one machine to another. But for all intents and purposes, the main uh, combine body and rotor and, and concaves and that are all virtually identical. So with the, with the odd the odd update um, coming to the pipe. So let's kick things off here. In order to kind of get our combines optimized here, uh, we want to, some of our goals is we want to minimize grain loss. We want to maintain grain quality. We want to maximize our productivity, which like tons per hour, achieve the desired level of residue processing and for, we have a good spread of the material. And then we also want to try and make sure we maximize our fluid efficiency, which basically is our, our fuel and depth usage. We have a number of optimization tools at our disposal, and we'll be going, kind of going into a little more detail and uh, speak into a little bit uh, of each one there a little more as we go through the presentation here. Uh, we have, uh, we can do power shutdown. Uh, we have combine advisor on the S700 series available and the X9s. On the uh, 600 series, we have interactive combine adjust where we, get, we have basically have on-screen assistance there for helping the, uh, operators get the get the most of their combine and to uh, counteract issues like a grain loss or grain damage uh, whatever grain loss pan or system you want to use uh, that is a very handy tool to help determine where losses are coming from and whether the adjustments that you're making have or are having any impact on it 
John Deere has the Equipment Plus app that is compatible with the iPhone and um, other applications there, Android phones. And of course, we all have the yellow books in our combines uh, that we can open up and take a look at the crop settings and that to help get our initial settings. I'm going to be using uh, the Equipment Plus app just as a quick run through for wheat. Um, here's our bushel, Bushels Plus uh, offering here for our grain loss checking. Uh, combine Advisor, we're going to start this video up here. Just let it run for a bit there. It gives you an idea what uh, Combine Advisor is all about. And as we go to the optimized performance, that uh, system is very uh, similar to some of the like the uh, interactive combine adjust uh, features on the earlier combines, just with the logic and process that they go through. One of the features of Combine Advisor is the set of active vision cameras, specifically designed to identify changes in grain quality. You can view these cameras by pressing the Live Camera button on the Combine Advisor screen. The Active Vision cameras provide a real-time view of the clean grain and tailings elevators. One of the benefits of the clean grain elevator camera is the View Grain Analysis option, which provides a color-coded identification of grain quality issues like foreign material, unthreshed grain, and broken grain in your sample. Prior to turning Auto Maintain on, you can utilize Optimize Performance to input grain quality or grain loss issues you are experiencing. You may select one or more issues at a time and report the level of severity for each issue. The system will utilize the current conditions and combine settings to recommend solutions. Solutions can be applied directly within the Optimize Performance tool. Harvest for a few minutes and check your grain sample again. Once the quality and loss levels of your sample are acceptable, it's time to set a performance target. Okay, I'm gonna leave that, leave that off there, because uh, Matt will be covering that in a little more detail when it comes to uh, performance targets and, uh, and auto maintain uh, features. So we're gonna go through a quick scenario just utilizing the Equipment Plus app. I'm just going to get there. my laser going here. So yeah, our Equipment Plus app. So um, when you first uh, download the system there, you, you need to add your uh, equipment into the app. I've added uh, the S600 and S700 series combines into the app. And uh, if you do that, I selected the S600 series. And from there, we can go crop settings. Uh, on another note, once we get into here, you'll see that there's actually a menu button. Uh, in that menu button, you can access uh, training videos, a display simulator, uh, JD parts, some manuals and training, uh, power shutdown procedure, which is uh, what we're going to be going through a little bit later, and also send feedback on the app. And it lets us know what the uh, version is as well. So going forward here, we are going to select a wheat normal. On the S700 series, you'll actually have harvester outside settings and header settings, and then harvester inside settings available to you in the app. So if we follow through the adjustments recommended in the app, uh, the first thing they go to is the straw chopper speed. They want you to set the straw chopper speed into high, uh, which is the fully, um, the T handle is fully uh, pulled out and you want to make sure that's engaged. The next step they have there is your crop diverter. Uh, they, we're going to have it set in a small grain position in this situation. Next step would be the feed accelerator speed set to high. We're going to discuss that a little further uh, later on in the presentation. And then we have our feeder host conveyor chain speed. Uh, they are saying to start with the feeder chain conveyor chain on, on the 26 tooth. And they have a note in there that you might need to do it up, um, change it up to the 32 tooth if you're working in tough wheat, tough straw conditions. And at the very front of the combine there, uh, our feeder drum position, typically in small grains for wheat, uh, we'd be running it in uh, the down position. 
you want to ensure that you set the lever in the down position on both sides of the feeder hose. Back at the straw chopper, uh, step six to seven, they're talking about engaging the knife bank. And on the uh, on the machines that have the uh, active tailing system, uh, you, we also want to make sure the active tailing system is uh, set up and placed in the small grains position. So once we get out, uh, do all our outside initial adjustments there. Uh, we have the harvester inside settings, and uh, it gives us a summary of the, the most common inside settings uh, for us there. For that specific crop. So back out of the feeder drum uh, position, uh, the, the other photo there, the other image that we had from the uh, Equipment Plus app, that was for a 600 series, it had a handle on it. Uh, this one here on the 700 series, you actually need a wrench to adjust it. Uh, you pull the spring pin out and you rotate it on the right hand side clockwise. And it will, uh, uh, to the so that this pin is in the up position up here. And on the left hand side, you'd be counterclockwise, so it's in the opposition in behind that hose there. I always find it easier to do the right hand side first, then do the left hand side because the left hand side's got a little more congestion there when it comes to obstacles in the way there to get that adjusted. Typically, you're not adjusting that a lot. Only if you're going into corn, do you normally have that uh, drum raised in the up position. There's a little closer picture of the uh, earlier with the handle. I say the handle is a little short there, so sometimes the wrench is a little nicer. So feeder speed, house speed option there. Typically uh, from factory, they come uh, with when you've got small grains package, you got a 26 tooth sprocket and a 32 tooth sprocket. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we mostly run our, our uh, conveyors in the slow speed. Uh, just for the simple fact that as long as it's feeding the, and the material into the combine, into the feed accelerator in a nice even mat uh, in an organized manner, uh, we don't need to you know, utilize extra horsepower, burn more fuel, and add more wear to our, our components there. So if we can run it in the, in the slow speed, keep it there. If you're finding that you need a, a different, um, a higher uh, difference in transition speed from the pay, from the from the header into the feeder house and then up to the feed accelerator, then you'd want to maybe go to the 32 tooth sprocket in those conditions there. Uh, just for example, I had to utilize that once there where typically in canola swath, I would be running low speed on the conveyor chain and low speed on the on the feed accelerator. I had a, a situation where uh, the swaths were a little bit had dense spots in them and it was causing lots of plugging issues. Um, I actually set the uh, the feeder chain into the high speed and the feed accelerator to high speed and it just increased that uh, different it helped pull apart those dense spots in the uh, in the swath and we gained basically a mile an hour which is about 30 percent when we we're uh, taking that uh, what our ground speed currently was. The feed accelerator, uh, you disengage this lever to relieve, relieve the tension, then you can move your belt uh, depending on what situation you're in. On uh, on the app there, they're telling you to util utilize uh, the high speed position for the feed accelerator. Uh, typically, again, I will start, especially in wheat, I'll start in the uh, low speed as long as it's feeding good. Uh, sometimes if in, in dry conditions, you can actually find that uh, the especially with the the more aggressive uh, feed accelerators we have now, uh, it can actually snap the heads and cause white caps even before it reaches the separator. So uh, there has been some recommendations to to run it in slow if you are seeing a white cap issue. Uh, again, it seems to me that uh, for the most part, it, the feed accelerator is able to feed the uh, the rotor and concaves. Uh, quite well in low speed and again you're utilizing less horsepower to run at high speed and also it is uh, definitely an advantage there to run in low speed because you have extra torque. Um, you, high speed you might have a little more inertia but uh, extra torque uh, it will help pull material in there a little bit more effectively as well. This picture here is of a, uh, uh, of a S700 series uh, feed accelerator. 
It uh, has a tough greens package in it. It's got the high capacity eight wing uh, feed accelerator. So um, it's, it's a very aggressive feed accelerator. Next back there is we want to make sure that we have the right rotor speed selected, uh, whether you're running high or low range. Uh, uh, they recommend that if you're running at uh, around 530 for an extended period of time that you, you move it to low range. Uh, typically, low range functions would be, uh, you know, do more delicate crops. Like if you have wind road canola that's dead dry and it's hot and dry, uh, then you want to you definitely want to be in low speed. If you're doing standing canola, uh, straight cutting canola, and if you have green stalks and, and you got some challenges there, then you definitely would be on the in the high speed range. Please, when you're adjusting this, uh, you want to make sure your combine is shut off at the time. Uh, you may have to rock this wheel a little bit in order to get the the uh, the shift collar to fully engage. Uh, the other point uh, being is that you often have to cycle power anyways to reset things so that it will pick up the, the speeds properly. We typically have two rotors that uh, we see up, up north in our part of the country here. Um, this, uh, the tri-stream rotor or bullet rotor, as you used to call it, um, is a little less common now than it used to be. Uh, we see a lot more of the variable stream rotor. It's got a longer taper, which allows you know, heavier straw uh, and more material to, to be able to be fed into the system there uh, and, and thrashed. The um, very, very speed rotor, uh, very, I'm sorry, very stream. The very stream rotor there is the only rotor that has the adjustable transport vanes available in the top hood of the um, combine of the of the rotor cover. Uh, so typically you have the standard and the advanced modes. Uh, advanced modes basically kicks out the material out of the separator two revolutions faster than if you have it in standard. So you might have a little bit of a trade-off coming uh, coming into play there, where if you're uh, if you want to maintain straw uh, quality for baling, uh, then you might lose a little separation capacity out of your separator. Whereas if you have it leaving the standard mode, uh, you might end up chewing up your straw a little bit more than desirable if you want to bale it. As we get into com concaves here, uh, there's always uh, a broad range of concaves. Uh, we're seeing a lot more mixing and matching. Uh, ideally, uh, John Deere and, and in their mindset there is if you're doing wheat, uh, they like to see uh, usually all small wire concaves in there, but that's just a recommendation. Uh, we're seeing lots of combinations where we'll see like a small wire, small wire, large wire. Um, and uh, even now, uh, Deere has an offering uh, that's factory installed, is able to be factory installed on the newer combines where you have a front max stress convex concave in the front, uh, small wire and then large wire. So uh, basically minimize concave ch changeovers when harvesting a variety of small crops. It may not be the best configuration for a specific crop, but it's you know, good for most is what, they're, is what they were shooting for. Regardless of what combination or type of concaves you're using, in order to kind of get a good uh, read on where, where you are and what your your um, your settings are, the concaves need to be properly leveled. Uh, they also need to be properly calibrated to zero, so you know what the actual position is of that concave uh, relative to the rotor and the threshing elements. I've had a situation where we were comparing two combines. Uh, one combine was set at six, they're both combines were set at 16, and we actually thought we had a horsepower issue on one of the combines. Uh, when we finally got digging into it far enough there, we found that uh, one combine was not zeroed properly. And when we had it at 16, it was actually at 20, so it had a lot lighter load and appeared to have more horsepower. So um, if you are running multiple machines in the same field, you definitely want to have all your machines dialed in there when it comes to your settings so that if you're opening up to a um, they go, uh, 20, 20 or millimeters, that is at actually at 20 millimeters and the other combine can then mimic or copy your settings and you'll have better success. 
Concave covers, when you are threshing top to thresh wheat, uh, say typically you want to run your concave fairly, or your rotor fairly fast, uh, help kind of knock that, uh, that wheat out of there, get as much uh, grain on straw or grain on grain threshing as you can out of the system. Uh, you want to do that prior to putting any, any concave covers in, see what you can kind of get out of your machine before you start covering up the concave, uh, as you like for every concave cover that you put in there, you're losing, you're, minim, you're reducing the maximum capacity of your combine by about 11% per cover. Um, on a uh, on a 70, like a 670 or 770 combine, if I'm uh, the first concave cover I typically would put in there is uh, where the tailings returns on those combines to the middle uh, middle concave number five position. I would start there, and then I would add. If I needed more, I'd add to the number one position, number two position after that. On your uh, on your larger uh, combines, the 80s and 90s, I would typically start at the front, one, two, three, and work way back because you have the active tailings on that com on, on that combine. Shoe loading uh, starts right under the concaves, uh, even shoe loading. So. Uh, on the auger bed, you actually have dividers that you slide up and uh, on the augers there, uh, depending where you find the, the the highest load of chaff and material other than green, uh, you might want to take and adjust those dividers. I usually start with them about three quarters away up on each side and then uh, work from there. Um, some of our guys actually use these little paddles uh, on the outside augers there to help flip more away from the outside towards the center. Uh, these little paddles were introduced onto CTS combine, so if you want to add them to yours, that's where the parts guy would have to look in order to find them. Going back to our separator here, uh, you see this guy is working with a separator grade covers on here. Uh, typically, again, I'll start uh, with a minimal amount of separator grade covers on there. I'll probably start with none and then uh, add as required in order to maintain even shoe loading. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't be putting any uh, separator covers in front of your grain loss sensors for your separator because that would uh, kind of defeat the purpose of having them there. You'd always have great separation, no losses. Um, as you're setting up your separate, as you're changing from crop to crop, just on this page here, I just want to make note that uh, this is set up for small grains right now. The uh, spacers are in the storage position. Uh, if you were setting it up for corn, you drop the, you take the bolts out, drop that grade down, and you put that spacer between uh, the grate and the frame, and that would drop it down to help prevent cobs from, get, cobs from getting smashed up and ending up in your tank. The rear one has no spacers in it on the um, 80s and 90s um, and, and the other combines actually as well. But uh, the reason that they're not there is so that um, there is no clearance between that and your tailings auger return tube. So you can't drop that anyways. On the 70 series, uh, it's like 677 series, 70 series, you could actually get spacers and, and drop that as well if they weren't already there. Uh, for additional kind of aggressiveness aggressiveness in the uh, the separator area, you can actually put uh, separator grade interrupters. Uh, typically, you can put up to eight in there, and you uh, they're um, they're installed on the right hand side, and you can put them in position. Typically, they're installed in position one and three. Uh, you can't go down below three there because you do risk uh, contacting uh, the separator tines, and you don't want to start uh, breaking those off in there. They just help disrupt the flow of material around there. Uh, to help, uh, it, you know, help, uh, help with separation. On your uh, your seven chaffer, you've got on this particular model, we have a adjustable front chaffer. In this picture here, you see one side's open, one side's closed. Uh, that's because you got two handles, and uh, so you have to get in there on both sides in order to adjust them. Uh, there are recommendations for those settings out of those uh, front uh, front uh, adjustable chaffers in the operator's manual. And uh, you can kind of go in there and get some recommendations for that. I can kind of, I got some here for just for example, uh, on wheat, uh, they recommend your, your adjustable front chaffer set to 24 to start with. Um, on your chaffer, top chaffer here on all the later combines, you have a dual zone chaffer. The rear 13 louvers are adjustable with a 10 millimeter wrench. 
Um, you can open or close those. Typically, the, the default is there. If you're in heavy side hill country, they want it open to 10. If you're in flatland, uh, typically you'd have it at five. Just know that if you're opening it up there, that everything that goes through those 13 louvers pretty much goes directly into your tailings. Maybe you mentioned Adjustable chaffer. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, uh, Matt just kind of say on some of the earlier combines uh, with the adjustable front chaffer, you actually had a long rod that you could reach in from the back and, and actually open and close them from the back. But you still have to kind of get up to the front there to actually measure to see how far you actually open them. So, uh, yeah, so quick example wheat's 24 millimeters to start with, canola, 5 to 10 millimeters to start with. And basically, there's more clothes than canola there because they want to keep the uh, the stocks from getting in there and hairpinning and you know get stuck in there. Uh, soybeans 24, corn 24. So 24 is a pretty common setting for that. Uh, also available there is a flat tooth flat tooth comb chaffer. Uh, basically, it used to be called our HP chaffer. Uh, there was some confusion exactly as to what it all worked well in. Uh, but uh, here's some conditions where they're not recommended. Uh, some uh, you know, high high yielding crops there, dry cereals with high chaff loads where clean shoe losses can increase and corn due to plugging of the of the chaffer with uh, husks and silk. Um, they are great for uh, canola and helping to clean up uh, the sample in the tank. And they, there are lots of situations where the flat tooth comb chaffer is an excellent choice. This is a bottom view of it, and you kind of see the little hooks in the bottom to help prevent these stalks from getting in there to, to um, hairpin and cause things to plug up. I always include a few uh, not, not really obvious checks. If I'm getting uh, cracks in the tank there, I will often make sure as I'm going around the combine to make sure that our our elevator chains are properly adjusted. Like the, the, what happens can happen is that both chains are get loose enough, grain gets between the rollers and the sprocket and starts and they get crushed. So in order to properly adjust those, uh, we typically take and uh, right at the bottom of the elevator there, we have the adjusting bolts there. You want to adjust the uh, the chain so that you cannot pull it away to any amount from the sprocket, the face of the sprocket but you're still able to move it from side to side to side across the face of the sprocket. Active tailings, if your combine is equipped with active tailings, uh, um, there are some settings there as well. Uh, we've seen that from the app there. Uh, I got the handle on this right in the middle there, so you can see both decals up. It's a corn position, and a lot of times canola is like that, and soybeans as well. Uh, small grain, wheat, oats, barley, uh, you're typically in that lower position there. Uh, if you've got a number of hours on your combine, it'd be a good idea to check the clearance because there are adjustments for the clearance of that uh, drum uh, to cover a distance there. Typically, if you pull that lever down further and you cover up half the hole, your your uh, your 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 rotor should be just touching the stationary rasp bars on that cover. So you take your chain off and you can spin that rotor by hand and determine whether or not uh, you've got a good zero setting there. So just like your concave up front is a good idea to make sure that that active tailings is, is in good working condition because on your 80 and 90 series combines, that active uh, tailing system is what gives you your extra capacity. You typically carry a higher uh, tailings load on the, on the 80 and 90 series combines than you would on your 70 series combines just for the simple fact is that you can actually thrash it out through that uh, tail, active tailings. Whereas when you when you bring in your uh, tailings back from your 70 series or 70 combine, 670 or 770 combine, it's good getting dumped back into the concave and has to be thrashed all back through there. So you want to minimize your, your grain going back into your tailings as much as possible uh, on the, on the uh, smaller combines, the 670 and 770 combines. So here's just a little closer look of that drum and that door where you'd make your adjustments to, to make sure that uh, you're you're getting that, that zero equation there. Here is your upper return tube there. Uh, on this tube, there is some holes across the bottom. In certain conditions and uh, straw types, and depending on what you're feeding back to your tailings, 
Sometimes that uh, those there's holes. Uh, they that material doesn't want to drop through those holes easily, and you'll end up with a lot more material on the uh, left hand side. So just watch if you're seeing the excessive loading on the left hand side and free grain or uh, coming through there. It may be because it's uh, the conditions and what you're feeding back through tailings. <clears throat> So this is an ideal situation there, I say, uh, on the active tailing system, if you're wanting to get maximize your combine capacity there, uh, you typically want to see nothing but unthreshed grain in that uh, tailings. And even with your, your with your tailings coming back on your 670, 770, uh, if you opened up the door and, uh, and just let them go on the ground as you're combining, you typically would only want to see unthreshed stuff there. If you have too much free clean grain, gra clean grain going up there, uh, you need to adjust your sieve or fan uh, to make sure that uh, we're getting that stuff into the clean grain tank and not back recirculating it through the system there. So when harvesting corn, let's say that uh, crop diverter there, just the reason why we want to make sure we have it in the right position. If you're already in the corn, uh, if it is in the corn position there, it prevents the cobs from being deflected back on the cleaning shoe and damaging your chaffer. Chaffer speed or chopper speed there, you have all the way in is for corn, that's slow speed. Uh, the middle position is neutral so that you can have, if you need to perform maintenance on it, you can roll it. And then the uh, fully extended or fully pulled out is your high speed for small grains. Your knife stationary knife bank in corn, you totally disengage it. You're not supposed to run it with it in there at all. Uh, on the small grain side, you'd like to see the, uh, the amount of Processing done there held to a minimum. As long as you're satisfied, I usually start with the recommend starting with the the knife bank uh, pulled out a bit and then push it in until you're happy. Because uh, if you push it in all the way, guaranteed you'll be happy, but you'll be probably burning more fuel and stealing more horse horsepower from the rest of the combine than than might be necessary. It all depends on your conditions, though. If you're finding uneven distribution of uh, residue uh, behind the con, uh, combine, there are uh, adjustments that can be made. Uh, typically, they're through the hole, side, hole in the side of the uh, left, right-hand side of the combine towards the back there, and you're adjusting this linkage here, which diverts material uh, from the discharge of the uh, separator uh, to one side or the other uh, of the residue package. And this is just a quick uh, view of the different residue packages here, the deluxe and, and the premium. So as we're uh, checking some indicators, uh, when we're talking about grain loss, uh, we want to make sure that the, the MOG material other than grain condition, straw condition, uh, we want to make sure the separator is good, our clean shoe losses are in check, tailings are managed pro properly, and a grain tank sample is is what you what you want to see. Your dockage is minimal. So our goals are to maintain and uh, and keep a nice organized flow of material into the combine. Uh, I've run into situations there where uh, even a slight lean on a standing canola crop can add uh, add significant uh, loss change from one direction from combine one direction to the other up to a bushel in canola is what we found. So as you're checking for losses, uh, if you do have a slight lean to your crop, uh, you might want to check uh, your losses in both directions and then focus on the direction where, where your losses are highest. So you always want to check your losses. Uh, where you check your losses matter. Uh, number one, you want to make sure you're checking pre-harvest losses, what's on the ground already. Number two, you want to make sure that uh, we can identify any header losses. Number six, basically, let's make sure that we have no leaks. I want to make sure that all our sumps are covered, uh, our, all our doors are closed, uh, that we have nothing kind of left open, stone trap closed, uh, three, four, and five. Uh, typically, I recommend, even though it's kind of some, sometimes a pain to manage after the fact, is dropping straw. Uh, it's what gives you the most accurate picture of where uh, your losses are coming from, especially if you have a good uh, grain loss system like uh, Bushels Plus, where you can drop a pan and identify losses and identify which sides maybe got more loss than the other. Uh, 
if you are dropping straw, it's a lot easier to find header losses on the outside here too, because you're not spreading straw into where you've already cut and, and potential loss from. <clears throat> so yeah, examples of leak points. If uh, you have a sub cover left undone, uh, these doors are improperly, uh, improperly installed. They can all contribute to losses. Usually if these doors are installed improperly, you get a lot of traffic build up on top of the, uh, the housing of the combine. One of say we're going to go through a quick power shutdown video. How are we doing for time there, Matt? Okay. Okay, so we're going to run the power uh, shutdown video here. Performance, productivity, and exceptional harvest experience. Go harvest. Get the most out of your S-Series combine today. Always follow safety instructions and understand all safety decals according to the operator's manual. Always use seat belts when operating the machine or riding as an observer. When parking and leaving the machine, disengage the header and separator. Move the multifunction lever to neutral and apply the parking brake. Shut off the machine, remove the key and lock the cab. The following video is a quick reference guide for how to effectively perform a power shutdown on your S-Series combine. Power shutdown is used to determine machine performance and identify required adjustments in the threshing and separating areas. Be sure to lock the brake pedals together and wear seat belts at all times. Closely monitor engine speed on the corner post display. Run the machine at the desired crop settings and throughput levels for at least 20 seconds or until the vision track monitor has stabilized. For pro drive machines, lightly depress the brake pedals. For non pro drive machines, fully depress the brake pedals. Quickly move the multifunction lever to the neutral position. Press the low idle button on the armrest. Allow threshing speed to drop and quickly disengage the header and separator engage switches as engine speed drops near 1200 RPM. Do not shut off the key switch. These power shutdown steps must be rapidly performed in just three to four seconds. Allow moving components to stop and let the engine cool down. Set the parking brake, shut off the engine, and remove the key. Visually inspect the threshing and separation areas. Visually inspect material for excessive grain damage, kernels left on the cob, and grain loss. <coughs> Look for uniform material distribution and free grain in the shoe area. Inspection should include the cleaning shoe, auger bed, return pan, fan system, tailings, and clean grain elevator. If no crop material is found in the shoe and separator, stop the procedure and restart the power shutdown. If material is found in the shoe and separator, make adjustments as needed. Recommendations can be found in the operator's manual. Decide what adjustments are needed. Re-enter the cab, fasten the seat belt, and restart the engine. Be sure all bystanders are clear. Open the threshing clearance and engage the separator for material cleanout. Adjust the machine to desired settings and continue harvesting. Repeat the procedure to verify grain quality and acceptable losses. Once acceptable loss levels are attained, calibrate the vision track monitor and continue to harvest. For more detailed information, consult the operator's manual.
OK, um, so that's a great little video there. However, there was a small a bit of an error there. Um, the actual kind of process that they want you to do is in your first step as you're starting the pro uh, the uh, the uh, power shutdown is they want you to um, press the low idle speed, then the brakes, and then quickly move the multifunction to neutral position. Uh, what I strongly recommend doing uh, when you're doing a power shutdown is just sitting there static in the yard with engine off is just run through those steps multiple times so you're comfortable with the sequence and then before performing one live in the field uh, it's, it will will help you get a get a good uh, snapshot of what's happening in your combine. So the reason for doing the power shutdown as I'm lost my place here um, is to maintain an even or like you so you can identify any any loading of the um, uh, uneven loading of the of the cleaning shoe so I lost the slide sorry about that but uh, so what what we're trying to do is uh, you'll see one one side of the shoe might have a lot more material on then the other side of this on the right hand side you might have very little so this allows you to identify where you might need to put separator grade covers in there whether or not you might need to uh, extend your your um, your concave pans or, or your concave slides your your conveyor concave or your uh, your concave conveyor slides up or down uh, in order to kind of maintain that that even matter material uh, on your cleaning shoe. So if we just kind of go really quick through some different uh, crop conditions here, for example, corn, uh, mog condition here, uh, cob size, a good rule of thumb basically is you got an average size cob, snap it in half, take a look at the uh, at the cob itself, measure it, slide a wrench over it. Uh, to get an idea of what's uh, what size or what your initial um, your concave clearance setting should be typically if you have uh, cobs that are easily bent or you can twist them uh, you might have an issue with splits uh, a good you know ready cob a good uh, a cob that's ready to harvest is one that uh, doesn't uh, doesn't twist isn't soggy uh, and you'll have better uh, better results when you harvest there With grain, uh, you want to when you want to check in your your threshing losses there. You want to identify any any material or any any, any um, grain unthreshed out of the head. Um, you want to identify if you've got things chewed up too much. Uh, so all those things, if you if you over process the straw and the separator and the concave, you run a good risk of <clears throat> overloading your shoe. And if your shoe becomes overloaded, uh, then you, you can be sloughing clean grain off right into your swath or right on into this into a chopper and spreader. Um, I've had situations where a couple minor adjustments have been, have decreased dramatically the amount of loss from a combine from from five five bushels an acre down to less than a bushel acre uh, just by opening up the concaves uh, by five millimeters and then opening up the sieve to accept the ex additional grain because as soon as we had the fortune we were fortunate enough to have uh, the clean grain cameras or the Activision cameras on the combine as soon as we made that concave adjustment we could see a, ho a whole bunch of clean grain ending up in our in our um, our uh, tailings and once we saw that we popped open the the sieve a little bit a couple millimeters that went away and uh, we were down to like 0.7 bushels of an acre loss and some pretty decent wielding, uh, yielding uh, wheat there. So uh, a couple of things, Jim, just a couple of scenarios here. Here's that uh, un, un, uh, uneven loaded shoe picture that I was looking for. Uh, so yeah, that's an, that's an indication that we're definitely overloading one side and that's where adjustments will be needed. You got very little to no material on this side. So and not very much on this side right now, just the way it stopped. This is more what we want to see is something that's fairly evenly loaded across the width of the machine. The high tailing scenarios can be caused by uh, incorrect chaff for sieve and, and fan settings. Allowing too much material to get into the into the, into the uh, tailings can cause you uh, to recirculate a lot of material, cutting down your capacity and potentially uh, uh, reducing your quality. 
uh, excessive trash and tailings, insufficient fan speed, chaffer too far open, over threshing caused by concave being too tight and too fast. So that's another situation there. So again, we're running a little higher uh, tailings loads in the ones with active tailings than we are in the ones without. A canola uh, scenario, we want to make sure that leaks and gaps and all that are properly sealed up on it. Uh, definitely with canola, uh, I, I've gotten in the habit of actually, you know, filling up the hopper three quarters full or more and then going basically shutting the combine off and going for a walk around and listening and watching and looking to see if we have any any grain tank leaks. Just as, as a quick recap here, uh, machine performance check there. Uh, we want to make sure things are set up as described in the operator's manual. Uh, verify that actual sieve, chaffer, and concave settings match cab display values. If not, perform the factory calibrations or the calibrations in your operator's manual. Uh, inspect uncrop, uncut crop for seed on the ground, pre-harvest loss. Operate the machine at acceptable ground speed. Monitor the grain loss performance monitor. Select the right seed, seed size or sensitivity. Uh, perform power shutdown if needed. Uh, take note of your performance indicators. Determine your losses. Make your necessary adjustments. Fine tune the combine for maximum performance. And if performance is acceptable, then you would uh, calibrate your grain loss system. And that is all I have for you right now. All right, and last but uh, hopefully not least, um, uh, I'm going to be going over some of the uh, technology in the combines. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about both the 600s and the 700s because there's quite a difference when we went from the 2630s to the to the Gen 4 displays in them, as well as some of the technology that became available in the uh, S700s compared to the uh, S600s. So just bear with me when I kind of go through some of these ones. There obviously will be some differences and I'm going to try and talk about some of this technology. So uh, some of the things that we will talk about here in this station of, or in this session will be our Harvest Smart, so our automatic feed rate. We'll talk a bit about active yields and some best practices for it. Uh, combine Advisor and Auto Maintain, I'll elaborate a little bit more into it uh, uh, than the, the video clip that Mike showed you earlier. We'll talk a little bit about active terrain adjustment um and the my operation center app as well as some requirements for infield data sharing which is definitely becoming more common uh with our 600s and 700 combines so one of the first ones here is harvest smart so like i mentioned that is uh our auto feed rate or uh, it helps enable the combine to have a, a more consistent uh ground speed so that will come in base with any of our combines that have a pro drive transmission so for that'll be all of our 680s and 690s or 780s and 790s uh, but the 670s and 770s it could be an option for them um, if they have the three speed push button uh, they will not be able to have harvest smart so harvest smart is going to be using three inputs for controlling our ground speed we will look at things like our engine load our, our grain loss and our rotor pressure so I got kind of a little bit of a screenshot here from uh, the 700 series combines. Um, so what we actually did in model year 20, they changed the software for Harvest Smart. So when they did that, we actually have from 2012 to model year 20, we now have four different versions of Harvest Smart on our combines. So a 2012 to 14 S series will have a version of Harvest Smart. The 14s to the 17s will have a different version. And then the 18s and newer can now actually be updated to all the same version uh, once we went to the to the 700s. So what we do is uh, on this on the S700s, we can set a maximum speed limit. We can set our aggressiveness on how uh, aggressively we want the speed up to the combine to speed up or slow down based upon a engine RP, uh, an engine load or a rotor pressure change. Uh, the same as what we could do on the earlier S600s. Uh, the difference now is with the newer ones, we're really just kind of a set adjusting our engine power target, where on the older software, we were adjusting our rotor target pressure um, as well. So now um, it's a little more simplified. You don't really see the rotor pressure uh, reading, but it is being calculated and used in the background with the software. And then just like in the older software that we had the option for our capacity or our loss uh, limits, um, we do have that in the newer software down there at the bottom where you can check mark from the box for the managed target with loss. 
So one of the things that I would recommend is if you do have a S your S700 combine, an 18 or a 19, um, I would make sure that it's up to date with software because um, it would get some of the changes that we'll talk about here a little bit with Combine Advisor as well. So that I won't go too much further into Harvest Smart than that. Um, there are some nicer features of the newer ones. When you engage your uh, unload auger, it pauses and, lo and locks your ground speed so it doesn't fluctuate while you're unloading on the go, uh, which is nice. Um, and it does learn the logic for your set speed a little bit faster um, in the newer software as well. So the next thing that we'll talk a little bit of is, is active yield. Now active yield can be put uh, anywhere from our brand new machines all the way back to the 2012 S series. So I'm sure some of you will have active yield on your combines already, but for those of you that don't, it is something that could be retrofitted. So the idea with active yield is that it's going to provide um, some continuous and automatic mass flow sensor calibrations, which is essentially means that every time we load and unload our hopper, um, we can do a recalibration for our yield system to try and make it more consistent, which is one of the big uh, focuses of it, as well as then to reduce our operator involvement. Um, so that we don't aren't spending all of our time stopped unloading in the cart, you know, taking weights, things like that, and and loading it into the system. So active yield does only work with a few select crops, and we'll go through that here in a little bit. But uh, before we use active yield, we should make sure that we have our moisture sensor temperature calibration done. So on our 2012 machines to our 2019 machines, there is a moisture sensor temperature calibration that should be done. And ideally, it should be done almost daily, and it should be done in the morning before the machine's exposed to the heat of the sun. Uh, once we got to the model year in 20 uh, newer, the moisture sensor, sensor changed, and we no longer have to do that calibration. So there are uh, a correction that you could put in there as well inside um, our moisture settings. Uh, this can be done on the 600s or the 700s. So if you took a sample from the combine and you took a sample into the yard and you tested on a tester and you found a discrepancy between the two, that's where you could go in and put that correction in to make it more consistent with the what you're reading off the tester in the yard. So how does active yield work? Well, we have three load cells that we have inside the hopper. And basically, as we fill the hopper up, we have grains going to pile on those three load cells. Um, it's going to start recording when we get more than 2,000 pounds in the hopper. And it's going to keep recording until we hit a uh, maximum of 6,600 pounds uh, inside the hopper. Um, because we have the picture there, the one thing I would like to point out that is when you're in the hopper, please be very careful not to stand on those load cells. Uh, that can actually uh, severely impact their operation and can some cases even, even wreck them. Um, so what it does is it's going to calculate that weight from those three load cells. Um, now there are some some implications of that. It's not like the whole hopper sits on the load cells themselves. So there are some things that can affect uh, the calculating of that weight. And we'll talk about that here uh, in a uh, couple minutes. Um, so with that, like I mentioned, there are some unsupported crops uh, with uh, active yield. So if we have a unsupported crop type set in the display, it will automatically turn active yield off. When active yield is turned off, that's when we would look at doing some of our traditional uh, yield calibration. So our multi-point or our single point calibrations uh, with the combines. So how we would like to operate our active yield is the first things that we should do is even before we did our moisture sensor temperature, we should make sure that we do our mass flow vibration calibration. So we wanna do that with the header attached to the combine. We wanna have the header drop down to operating height and we want to make sure that we have the separator and the header engaged. And that's basically going to shake the combine gently. So it reads that as the baseline to make sure that our mass flow sensor can read more accurately. Um, so once that is performed, so that should be done every time you change headers um, and potentially every time you even change header, uh, take the header on and off. But at least every time you uh, change the header, say from a be uh, your belt pickup to your um, flex draper or your flex auger header. Um, then, like I mentioned, calibrate your your moisture sensor temperature. Um, 
So then with that, then we can make sure that we actually have to have our active yield turned on. Um, so once it's turned on with one of our approved crop types, which we can now see down there in the bottom left. So our, our approved crop types for active yield is wheat, barley, uh, canola, corn, and soybeans. They have added rice, but that won't affect us a whole lot here in Manitoba. Um, but deer is still looking at adding more crop types to that. It just takes time to, to do some testing and build the logarithms for it. Um, I know fall rye, peas, um, uh, and oats have been big, uh, big requests with deer and they are working on more, more crop types as we go. So one of the things that we can do in the software is we can see how many loads that have been accepted or samples, and we can see our sample quality. So those bars generally don't fill up until we do more and more samples or, or loads with the combine. Um, so we can see kind of between the difference between the two. Once we kind of get above five samples, that's when we will see those bars fill up to make sure that we're having the higher confidence uh, in the quality of the samples taken. Now, once we generally have, say, at least 10 to 15 samples taken, if you were still seeing a difference in load weight compared to what you might be reading on your grain cart, that's where you can go in and input a yield correction. Now, we don't want to do that right away. You want to wait to try and let the system run, take a bunch of samples um, to make sure that it can build a good data set to allow the active yield to work properly. But then after that, you can put the correction in. Uh, that one a whole lot. So one thing we should talk a little, bit, a little bit with active yield is why would a sample be rejected? OK, which does happen with the machines. So if we can't fill at least that 6,600 pounds of product into the tank in, in less than 400 seconds, which is just over six and a half minutes, um, it will uh, re uh, reject the sample. If we start and stop the machine really quick or if we're on really rough terrain, that can reject the sample. So basically it means if that the pile of product in the tank can shift or slide, that will reject it. The same thing is if we are reading from our receiver a roller pitch more than four degrees, that will reject the sample as well because that would cause the, the product in the tank to slide or shift. And the last one is um, unloading on the go. Um, if we stop and we try to unload on the go when we're between the 6,600 and the 2,000 pounds of product in the hopper, it will reject the sample as well. So. So those are just a few things to keep in mind with our active yield. Generally so far, their feedback for the most part has been positive. You know, once the system kind of runs for the most part with things calibrated well, we've been within a few percent um, between actual yield off the, off the field. So in a lot of cases, that's, that's quite good. So, okay. So the next one we'll talk a little bit is like Mike mentioned with interactive combined adjust. Um, so with our new software for the 700s, now when it's updated, we call it combine. It's been updated to just combine advisor and it's changed the layout is what you can see on the pages there a little bit. I should turn my laser pointer on here a little bit so we can see it's done a few changes where we still see our current settings in the top left. Um, we no longer see our priorities uh, hit, uh, here on the side, but we do see a lot more of our automation statuses. So it gives us a lot more information into the status of our harvest smart or our terrain adjust or our auto maintain. We still have the ability to go in and see our history and our and our live cameras with the combine advisor. Um, we've had quite a few changes up here with the optimized performance. Um, but then down here in our automation status, it stayed somewhat the same. The biggest change is with the auto maintain. We now have the ability to see a progress bar. So when we click that set performance target below it to try and set our auto maintain, we actually see that bar. So we have an idea how long it might take to when it's going to be completed uh, setting that performance target. So um, like I mentioned, this is one of those things that will be updated if you update the software from a uh, 2018 or 19 combine to a uh, uh, to the newer versions. So I, I should point out the other on the other note, the other feature that it will also give you if you have a power cast or an advanced power cast tailboard is uh, auto swap. So the chopper will auto swap your offset from left to right for your wind compensation. That will also be given to you when you do the software updates uh, to the 18 and 19. So the auto maintain, there are those those components to it. So we do see the camera on our tailings and our clean grain camera, as well as the, the, the controller there, the GQM that will control all of that. 
But one of the nicest features is the fact that we can actually see what is on the cameras and what the actual cameras are detecting for issues with the grain in the clean grain. Uh, so we can it can detect and tell you whether it's white caps or cracked grain or light or heavy foreign material. So inside our um, auto maintain system, we do have sensitivities that we can adjust. So we can go in here and make adjustments. So if we want the combine to adjust or be more sensitive to grain loss, we can do that. But if we want it to maybe be less sensitive to adjustments, say on broken grain, um, say for example, with soybeans, you know, we are allowed a, a fair percentage of splits. We could adjust that so that it's not a, such a big concern with the combine, but say if we were doing, um, you know, uh, wheat, then we wouldn't want a bunch of splits in it or say corn or cracking, we can adjust that to try and uh, control the sensitivity of that. So down there in the automation status, the big one that we'll focus on is our history. So when we go and tap our history button in the bottom, that will give us all of the adjustments the combines made in the last 27 minutes. And what that will look like is something like this on our screen. So once our performance target is set, anything that is in the green and below means that it was it is within spec of the set performance target. Once those lines read above the green, that's when it is above our performance target levels, and that's when the combine will start to look at making adjustments. So it's nice that you could actually see at the top what we're actually reading from lost levels from our separator and our shoe from our sensors, as well as our tailings load. And then in the bottom, it actually shows us what it's reading for, say, broken grain or unthreshed with, say, white caps or our light or our heavy foreign material. The other nice thing is up there at the top, it does show our bushels per hour. And that is we can adjust that a little bit. So that could show us the actual throughput of the combine as well and how that relates to what the cameras and things are reading at the time. So what we can also do then is up there at the top, uh, we're on our performance right now. We can also go to the active tab or the completed tab, and that will give us an indication here under the active tab what settings are currently being changed on the machine. So we can see the bottom one is our auto maintain. So it's adjusted our concave, our rotor speed and our fan speed. And that has been done for multiple reasons. And it shows how long that those changes have been in, in effect. And right above that is our terrain adjustment. That's why we see the hill or the slope with the arrow. So in this case, we made a fan and a chaffer adjustment. Um, and the reason is, is because we were over four degrees of slope. So it made that adjustment, okay? Um, one thing that did happen in model year 21 is we did get a change to the cameras. Um, for those of you that have had the system, you've probably seen at times we've had some issue with uh, condensation and some moisture on the inside of the cameras. So they changed the cameras to add a desiccate cartridge that we can change and replace at the side of the camera so that we can try and remove that moisture out of that camera housing. So the optimized performance is another big one uh, that Mike kind of showed a little bit. There were some substantial changes to it, it to the, this system. So if you were unsure a little bit, as you know, if you want to, if you needed help making adjustments to the combine itself, uh, it allows you to select multiple issues here on the left hand side. So you could check mark if, say, if you were having issues with uh, unthreshed material, say white caps with your wheat, and then maybe you were having some issues with shoe loss. You were able to you'd be able to select both of them at the same time. So once you select a multiple issue, it will actually then allow you to select how severe that issue is. So if it's a really big problem or whether it's a minor problem, you can select those. Once those are selected, then the combine will think for a few seconds and then it will give you options uh, to make those adjustments. So here we can see in the recommendations here in the middle of the screen, we could tap on these arrows and it will give multiple, multiple things that we can try. Some of them will be as simple as a combine setting. Some of them will involve going out and installing, say, filler bands or removing them or, or making a ta active tailings adjustments. Things like that uh, are all options for adjustments here. Um, but it gives you things that you can try. You can then hit the apply button and then it will make those changes. And then uh, it will ask you, were you happy with them? Are you not? And then if you'd like, you can continue with changes. Or if you're happy with how things are set, then you can kind of finish out of the mm -hmm. optimized performance and continue to come by. So it's actually, I think, a little more user friendly now than we've we've had it in the past. So. Uh, the next bit of technology then is our active terrain adjustment. Now, this one's a little more hands off and definitely a little more relevant to those once you kind of get out of the Red River Valley, where we have a little more 
a little more rolling terrain. So what terrain adjustment does is it's going to automatically adjust our cleaning fan, our chaffer and our sieve based upon whether we're going uphill or downhill. So if we're going downhill with our combine, generally in that case, we might have a tendency to have a little more tailings load, you know, a little more chaff going to the back of the combine. So in that case, our cleaning fan would speed up and we could close our chaffer or our sieve uh, to try and limit that. And then on the flip side, if we were going uphill, um, we might have a little more tendency in this case to throw a little more grain out the back. So now in this case, the fan, the system would actually slow the fan down a few RPM, as well as open up the chaffer and the sieve to make sure that we're not throwing grain out the back. Now, terrain adjustment is retrofitable back to the 2000. 16 combines when we got our new uh, the Dynaflow plus cleaning shoe. Um, but with it, we do have a few things that we can adjust with it as well. We can go in and adjust our sensitivities a little bit, whether we're going uphill or downhill. And then on the right hand side, there are the offsets that we control. So how much the chaffer or the sieve might adjust and the cleaning fan as well. Now, depending upon the crop type you have selected, it will kind of give you some presets in there and a limit to how much they will change. So you can't say set it to adjust your chaffer 10 millimeters. Um, it might only let you do it two to four millimeters, depending on the crop type. So. But you can set that. Yes, you could tap on any one of these guys here and it would open up and let you make an adjustment to that. OK, now the next one, this is just kind of referring to the Gen 4s, but it's become very, very common with our machines now. It's quite easy to do infield data sharing so we can share our guidance lines, our coverage maps and even our yield and moisture maps. Uh, from combine to combine as we're in the field. So these are just some of the requirements that we need for that. So you do need to have a version two processor with your command center. You do need to have a premium 3.0 activation as well as a 3G or ideally a 4G MTG. You uh, no longer need to have a JD Link Connect subscription because that is included from John Deere now. And you do need to have 2018 or newer software. Now, if you have an S600, we can put 4640s in them and we can achieve the same thing. We can also do it with 2630s as well um, with a MTG and a machine sync activation for the 2630. So we can do it back, uh, back to the 2012s as well. And then just a note on the bottom, generally the higher the level of accuracy or correction level with our Starfire receiver will lend itself to some better results when it comes to doing the data sharing and the guidance line sharing. Okay. Last but not least, we'll talk a little bit briefly here about the My Operations Center app. So with it, I don't have a whole lot of pictures here for you guys, but um, the Operations Center app has really kind of changed the game for, I find for a lot of customers. We have guys a little more caring about their data. It's so simple and easy to view that data in, inside the app itself. Um, so with that, we can obviously view your, you, you can view your yield and your moisture data, you know, as you're combining that will update with a Gen 4 display every 30 seconds to Op Center mobile or on the app um, with a 2630, it will do it when you're completed on the field. Um, you can also view your equipment data so you can see things like your fuel level, location, how much def, um, you know, some efficiencies on the machine. Um, but really one of the nice things um, is remote view and adjust as well. So with this, we can remotely view our combine settings, which is what we're kind of looking at here on the right hand side of the slide. Um, so with that, we can also then adjust our combine settings from our phone. So unfortunately, this does only work on the S700s and newer with up to date software. Um, but one of the nice benefits of this is if you do have a couple combines running in the field or you're out checking for losses, you can send adjustments to the combine. The operator in the cab has to accept them. Um, they just won't automatically change on the combine when you send them from the phone. Once the operator in the cab accepts the changes or doesn't accept them, that will notify you in the app as well as to if they were those uh, settings were accepted by the operator. So it is kind of a, a nice feature for sure. Um, it is handy uh, to be able to view the settings and, and make changes and tweaks, especially if you're working with multiple combines in the same field uh, at the same time. So, okay. Um, and last but not least, this is a bit of a newer one. So you guys might want to write the number down, but we do have a new solution support number. Um, and it's a little bit of a different uh, way for you to reach us. So we, you can still reach us with our cell phone numbers that your product specialists or solution specialists have always had. But the idea with the number is that you can call or text this number. And then if you call, it will give you the ability to select, um, you know, select one for, I think it's Oak Bluff, uh, Brandon's number four, um, I believe. 
Um, so you can select that and then that will ring to the solution specialist uh, for those stores. Um, if a solution specialist is unable to take your call, it will become available for the other solution specialist to get in touch with you. So if you leave a voicemail or you text to that, the other solution specialist can see it and then they can get in touch with you as well. So if it's sometimes a simple question and your regular solution specialist is tied up, this will allow us to maybe get back to you faster, you know, in a more prompt manner. Um, the other nice feature with this too is if you do call or text, um, it does create a ticket in the background for us. Um, so what happens then is if we are helping you and assisting you, if you do call or text back while we've been helping you with an issue, you will get directly back in touch with the specialist you were talking to. So you don't have to call back in and, and select um, which which specialist you might uh, you might need to reach. So um, I would recommend uh, writing down the number. Um, because it will be helpful, hopefully help you guys and hopefully help us support you guys a, a little better as well. So, okay. Um, another part too is as we're getting into the start of harvest here, we do provide on-farm optimizations. So I did post up there for the headers and for the combines, kind of what's in, in, involved with, the, with those. Um, so with that, that allows us to come out. If you guys do need some more training or you do have more questions from the training here today, it's kind of hard to put a pile of information into a two hour virtual clinic. But if you do need more assistance or you want help with calibrations and some best practices and procedures or help setting the combine in the field, we are available to support you guys like that. We obviously just need a bit of heads up um, for it. You know, we all, all get tied up and busy in the season just like you guys. Um, and we just sometimes can't be there immediately, but we're more than happy to come help, um, to help you guys optimize those combines and really try and get the most out of them. With our crop prices, the way they're looking this year, we're obviously gonna wanna try and save every, uh, every bushel that we can, um, uh, especially with harvest being a little bit late this year as well, as well, most likely. So uh, with that, that's actually um, all of the content that we have here for you guys this morning. If you guys have any questions, feel free to type it here in the chat um, uh, for a little bit. Um, other than that, if you guys want, we can, we can unmute a mic if you guys wanna ask us a question. Um, the one thing I did type earlier, this uh, this has been recorded, so we will actually will be posting this uh, up on our Ends Brothers YouTube. So if you guys, if there's something in here that you'd like, you can review it uh, review it later. Um, but other than that, that's kind of all of the formal content we have for you guys this morning. So hopefully you enjoyed it and have some things that you can take away and leverage to get ready here for for harvest that'll be coming here in a few weeks. So with that, the three of us here will just kind of stay uh, stay on the line here for a little bit. And if you guys have any questions, feel free. So actually, we did have a couple of questions um, uh, from registers that we realized we didn't maybe quite touch base on. So it might just be easier to, to talk about them. We were going to type them in the chat here, but one of them was about hard to thresh wheat um, and maybe dealing with white caps. So realistically, there's a few ways that we can help with that. One would be, you know, obviously tightening, tightening the concave down. But, uh, but with that, uh, we're going to run into issues, you know, of, of the busting up straw too much, um, limiting capacity on the combine, burning a lot of extra fuel. Um, so tightening up the concave isn't necessarily the best way to do that. Uh, generally speaking, the traditional way with small wire concaves is to put in more filler bands as well. So um, for the six, uh, the class eights and class nines, we just start at the front and kind of keep adding filler bands. Now that does detract a little bit as well because we do remove some of our threshing uh, area for the grain to fall out and kind of eliminate some of our separating capacity. Um, the other way too, which we found some success in some stores is with the new max thresh condex concaves. We have found quite a bit of success putting them uh, uh, in the front. Um, it's as aggressive as our small wires with filler bands, but we don't have filler bands in them. So it does give us more, uh, more ability to separate that grain out uh, quicker uh, with the combine. That being said, it does have some limitations with the Condex as well. You know, if you have some really, really sensitive crops, uh, that might not be the best choice. And I guarantee you it doesn't work great in flax. Um, so it's not necessarily the an the end all answer, but it definitely can be one solution for that. Uh, what was what was the, one of the other ones there? Uh, uh, canola very straight cut. <laughs> there was a question about canola settings, and I guess it really depends whether it's straight cut or swath canola. and. It's kind of a, a, tr a tricky question to answer, admittingly, because we've kind of found that that the canola settings can vary 
quite a bit, depending upon what the conditions are. We've had, you know, really nice ripe canola standing with the pods and the stalks and stems, you know, and you can actually be a little more gentle with it, you know, not maybe quite as much as you might have been with, you know, swath canola with like you know, the slower rotor RPMs and things like that, because you're really worried about overloading the shoe. But then we've seen canola that's dry with 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 dry pods, but exceptionally green stalks where you're you're not quite, you know, with wheat settings, but you're definitely much closer to wheat than you would be with traditional canola settings. So admittedly, it's kind of a hard question to answer. It's it's quite subjective. One thing that I noticed last fall uh, is that if we did have canola with green stalks, uh, we were we were better off to treat the straw and material uh, a little more gently, like not have our concaves quite so tight. Uh, what I was finding is that if you started bruising and, and damaging the stalks any more than you had to, that's when we started tying up uh, the berries and canola getting stuck to the stalks and actually having the stalks split open and then material and, and like berries and that uh, canola actually get inside the stalk and as they come into the separator, they close up again. And if you're dropping straw and you you uh, look at your straw sample, you can actually open up the the canola stalk, and there'll be about a dozen berries sitting inside the stalk. Yeah. So there's a, a bunch of different uh, scenarios that uh, that can you can be confronted with. So I guess specifically, uh, no no one one shot does all. Uh, there's a there's a number of different uh, adjustments that can can come into play there. Yeah, I guess as the sprayer guy, the one thing I guess I will comment on, um, just with a bit of experience, whether uh, depending how you desiccate with, you know, canola going to be a little later this year. If you're going to be out desiccating in September and the temperatures look like they're going to be cool, um, Roundup and heat can sometimes struggle to work in cooler temperatures. It could take two weeks um, or more, even a little more for the crop to kind of mature to come in. Uh, so it's in a nicer threshable condition. Um, so if we do get later in the year like that, from my personal experience, something like Reglone, even though it is does come a little bit more of a, as a premium um, in terms of application, it definitely will help a much more consistent dry down of the canola and it definitely will make it easier to thresh uh, and a little more consistent, um, especially if we get into times into September with, with the canola. So um, what else did we have there? how to set to 780 in small grains. Yeah, we had one question about like setting a 780 in small grains. Well, that's a little, honestly, in some ways, it's not a whole lot different than, than the previous S series. Um, it hasn't changed significantly. We just got a little more shoe area and things like that over the years than we might've had in the previous models. Um, but a lot of the settings are still relatively the same. Yeah, typically when I'm approaching setting the combines in small grains, I, I kind of mule the thumb is, I'll, I'll start with things uh, running slow uh, as I can. I'll have things more open than, uh, and maybe have a, a dirtier sample to start with, but uh, minimize my loss right off the hop. And then start kind of, you know, cleaning up my sample and, and working towards minimize and, and keeping my losses at a manageable level. So it's just a matter. So I find that if you uh, if you tighten things up too much on these combines to start with, you're reducing capacity right off the hop. You might achieve good uh, good uh, grain loss levels and uh, and uh, clean and, and clean sample, but you might be reducing the total capacity of your machine unnecessarily. So always kind of go a little bit on the more open side and 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 clean it up from there instead of going from the clean side. And uh, and and main, trying to maintain it that way because that's where sometimes you'll get tripped up and actually have more losses than you than you think by because you're over processing material and overloading the shoe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and we did we did have one question about trying to conserve straw quality. Um, so generally speaking, mo most of the S series have a uh, variable stream rotor and they have the ability to adjust those uh, rotor cage vanes from the cab. 
Um, definitely putting those to the advanced position could help save some straw. You do have to be aware, though, like Mike mentioned earlier, that that can limit your separating ability. So um, you do need to be cognizant of that, that you can definitely increase your rotor loss a bit um, by putting them in advanced. The other way is really to try and help them with straw quality is really just as open as you can uh, with your concave. Uh, your concave clearance and and as slow as kind of on the rotor as you can. That will be kind of the biggest uh, biggest contributors to helping with your straw quality and and having your feet accelerator on low uh, will help with that as well. Um, especially if you get into dry conditions, a feet accelerator on high can can bust up your straw quite a bit on its own. So those are kind of all things that there you can do to to help maintain some straw quality. So. I think that's most of them, Chris, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think that's most of the questions. So hopefully if you're still on, hopefully uh, that was maybe an answer to your question. But yeah, with that, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of all the questions we had, at least from uh, from the registration, which we do appreciate when guys do that. It's kind of nice to have some of those in advance. Um, and we don't really seem to have any more questions coming in. So with that, it's kind of six minutes after 11. I think that's, we're gonna kind of call the clinic. But of course, if you have any questions, you know, Please contact your local solution specialist at your dealership. We're more than happy to help. Um, that's what we're here for. Um, but with that, that's kind of we'll call the uh, the the clinic for today. And thank you for attending. And thanks for your for continued business with Ens Brothers. And hopefully, we can all look forward to here to a to a nice harvest and a happy harvest. And Thanks. and be safe out there. And yeah. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending. And uh, we'll probably talk to all of you at some point this fall. <laughs>